if one time we want to speak about, you know, the collective power of black people, well, what are you talking about? Do you mean the collective power of African people? You mean pan-Africanism or pan, uh, pan then say African. I don't understand why people are so wedded to the term black. And the justification for it is, well, it's because the European made it negative. It's the European's word. It was negative before it was applied to African people. It's like they're getting it backwards. It isn't that Europeans said, we're gonna make this word black negative in order to accommodate our desire to devalue African people or dark complexioned uh, Asian people or dark complexioned Native Americans. That's not how it worked. The word black, right, absence of light, if you will, was supposed to, to, to be uh, understood by any English speaker as largely negative before it was applied to people of African or Asian ancestry. Dr. Akbar, the <clears throat> prominent African-American psychologist, often talks about one of our issues is that we have become, I mean, we meaning people of the African world, whether it's the continent or, or more especially within the diaspora, so-called black folks, are very reactive rather than proactive, which means that if this individual is calling himself white, we're gonna react and call ourselves black because we're the opposite. Not really understanding that we're not exactly taking a step in the right direction because now, as I like to say, given all the, cult, the linguistic and cultural baggage of black, you are trying to push an elephant uphill on roller skates. You're trying to turn a negative into a positive when there's a clean, pure, stream nearby to draw from. Uh, if you're referring to complexion, in fact, uh, there's a famous um, scene in the movie Cry Freedom about the life of Steve Biko. Uh, the presumption is that this event actually occurred. If it didn't, it still made sense in terms of the screenwriters and Richard Attenborough putting it into the film. And that is, Steve Biko was in court He's charged with basically, you know, being seen as a threat to the apartheid system, and he was banned. So he's in court talking to the European judge, the Boer British judge, and the judge says to him, Why call yourselves black? I mean, you people are more brown than black. And Biko says, Why do you call yourselves white? You people are more pink than white. And the judge goes, Precisely. But there's no deeper unpacking of what just occurred. And it raises an important question about systems of oppression. Why did Europeans decide to designate themselves as white? More specifically, English-speaking Europeans, because the term white is an English term. When you know why they chose the term, then you know what they sought to gain by it. When you also see that they leveled the term black against us, Asiatics, Africans, Asians, then you know what they sought to gain by imposing that on us. But why the need to fixate on black? There's the work of a Harvard uh, psychologist um, who I believe is of, of East Indian ancestry. Her name is Dr. Benaji. And her work on looking at uh, the implicit association test, which is used by psychologists to look at um, implied bias, or biases that exist 
She recognizes what are often called mind bug, or she, in fact, she coined the term mind bugs, which are culturally imposed perceptions of reality. And the dominant perception of reality for those of us who speak the English language is when you say black or use black, its dominant use is negative. Black magic, black night, uh, black death, right? And to try to overcome that is very difficult. Now, this is a Harvard faculty member, psychologist, prominent psychologist who's pointing this out, and she calls them the mind bugs. Now, part of what people can do, you could say, well, you need to get people to stop thinking of black as something negative. Okay, that, that's all right, but in the context of, do you, do you want to fight that battle, or more importantly, should you be fighting that battle? Because you're still reducing yourself again to your pigment. And you're not looking at yourself in the context of a larger history. And if you want to, like I said, if you want to speak of we as, as uh, highly melanated people, or we as an UC, or we as, as I would say, people of predominant African ancestry, that makes more sense to me. I'm just, I'm just saying. So when I looked at what Drew Ali was trying to convey, and did convey, obviously, to those who heard what he was saying, back in the 19, early teens and 1920s in particular, that you are not black, you are not Negro, you are not colored. Just on a psychological level, I can see the value. I haven't even gotten into what the value and importance of what he was saying by, by having folks reject calling themselves Negro, black, or colored, because that's a whole nother issue. I just got into the psychology of it, right? That's why people, you know, confuse. I've often thought of this. You have a child um, reading about the Black Knight and the Black Death and the Black Plague, and then the child goes, oh, and I'm a black child. What Benaji and others, Eric Heyman, who's another social psychologist, psychologist who's talked about this issue of implicit bias and its roots, not in the individual mind. You know, part of the pers perspective on this is um, many psychologists are now trying to figure out why is it that police tend to shoot quote unquote black men at, uh, uh, at the rates that they do. And is it because the individual police officer is overtly uh, racist? And what some of this psychology is now suggesting is it may not be a sense of overt racism, but rather the culturally imposed racism, what people used to call national character, how nations see themselves as a result of their particular histories and experiences. So, like I said, Drew Ali, just on, in terms of saying you're not Negro, Black, and colored, was getting people out from under that weight of the negativity associated with blackness. And for people who say, well, it's better, the same person would not allow you to call him a Negro. But with all due respect, Negro is the same thing as black. If I'm speaking Spanish, I'm a, it's a Negro. I'm gonna call you a Negro, right? So it doesn't make any sense. Yet, again, more is a reference to a people, to an empire that covered a geographical location. The Moorish Empire at one time was from the northwestern part of the Maghreb or North Africa, all the way down to the Senegal River and as far east as the border of Egypt. That's part of what, and I'm just talking about what we know as the recognized Moorish Empire in terms of international uh, and diplomatic history and relations. So we can say that covers a wide swath of the African continent. That would include Africans of various hues, people who would be darker in complexion and others who'd be lighter in complexion. And the primary sources from uh, uh, Duarte, Portuguese travelers, and Azrara, 
and uh, English sources all affirm that the term Moor was used for people of African ancestry. Later, the term Blackamoor is introduced, but it's part of the development of the kind of pigmentocracy direction that exists. Within the English language, just as in other languages, there are different ways to translate something more accurately. So, and one of the examples I've often used is the difference in Spanish, if you're speaking of knowing someone versus knowing something, you don't use the same verb. Conocer and saber is not the same thing, right? One means to know a person, one means to know about something. By the same token, if you translate more to simply mean black, knowing that black in the English language is affiliated with so much negativity, long before it was ever referenced for people of African, or I dare say Indian ancestry, because a lot of people seem to, to be under the impression that black was only used to refer to people of Africa, and that's not true. Black was, and in some cases, is still used to refer to people of Asia by Europeans. My first trip to um, England, and I was talking to um, people from Indonesia and Pakistan and uh, Cambodia and different parts of Southeast Asia, and they were bringing to my attention how you can read articles in the paper, and this is in the early 90s, where they would talk about a black person doing something, usually it might have been affiliated with some criminal act, unfortunately, which was part of their point at the time. But they were saying that the term was used to encompass them. And there was a debate between the younger generation of these people from Southeast Asia saying, well, we'll use the word black. I mean, people in the Americas have a black pride movement and, and you know, there was black consciousness in South Africa. And then there were those who were elders who were uh, averse to it. They didn't like it because they said, you don't want to be encapsulated simply in a color because now the emphasis is simply on your color and not on your culture. So they said, well, they saw the value of, meaning the young people saw the value of trying to use a new hip kind of term, if you will. But the elders said no because what that's doing is reducing your value because in the English language, black is largely associated with a bunch of negativity. And just like Richard B. Moore said in his book from the 60s, um, the, the term or the word Negro, its origin and evil use, he made the same argument. Why you shouldn't use the term Negro? Well, guess what? Negro is Spanish for black. So folks went from Negro in Espanol to black in English, but it's still the same thing. And I literally mean thing. So defining yourself by an ethnicity or a nationality clearly would make more sense. And when the late great um, political scientist uh, Ali Mazrui, who was known for doing a series uh, back in the 80s on Africa. Um, he was Kenyan born. Um, he actually said, uh, black people are the only group in the United States that is designated racially as opposed to geographically, right? Um, or nationally. And this is part of the problem, right? You have, and that's why I've said to people all the time, why don't we speak of yellow Americans, right? If we're gonna use the color nomenclature, use it across the board, just use it all the time. But if someone will say, well, you know, I'm, you know, I'm Irish, I'm German, I'm black, and they're running through their lineage, and I'm going, all right, Germans come from Germany, the Irish come from Ireland, black, what is that? At least, well, I don't, because you know, we don't know where we're from. You can at least say Africa. At least say Africa, right? At least say African. I'm part, I know I have some African answers. And now in this day and age, you can even do an ancestry.com test and 
They can tell you, right, what part of Africa, what ethnic group or uh, nation or so-called tribe one is from, right? So the value of not identifying with black is it compels you to be more specific in identifying culture, knowing your geographic origin, knowing your history. Again, it's not that black is negative because it's associated with people of African ancestry. I keep telling people, it was, black was negative before it was applied. That's why those who wanted to oppress us used it, right? And even in, the, in Spanish, the term negro, they called Africans who they had enslaved or who were oppressed by them or, or suppressed of all three of the, of the above, they called them negros, right? They were saying, and at one time they also said piezas, which means pieces, like things. But the idea is, again, to say, you don't have personhood. I've made you into a thing. Now, if someone says, yeah, but what about the word white? White is not a nation either. No, but white in the English language was understood to be affirming of everything favorable, right? So when people said white, that's why, in, uh, as you know, in the Moorish tradition, when uh, the prophet said, white means purity, purity means God, and God means the ruler of the land. So when you see white in that context, and even in the, in the medieval period when the Templars, because there is a Masonic element to part of this too, referred to living a good life as a pure and white life, which meant they were supposed to be honorable men, which meant they were supposed to respect life and live as Christ had instructed as far as we understood it. But that was the phrase, a pure and white life. So they're using a term for themselves that's meant to affirm and empower. Because like I said before, uh, in referencing, you know, Biko versus the judge, he said, you're more pink than white. So why do you call yourselves white? Well, because white is a lot more culturally affirming of our power, our divinity, our, our superiority than calling ourselves pink, right? And if we were to actually say to someone, you know, uh, show me a black person. Show me some, so I've seen, because I've heard people say, I've seen people who are jet black. Yeah, I've seen people who are also very dark in hue as well. People say almost like a bluish or purplish tint. But the vast majority of, of people who you're calling black don't look like that. Just like the vast majority of people who you're calling white don't look like this paper. Right? So it's not about complexion. That's what's so disturbing. It's not about complexion. There's an area of, of um, science known as neurolinguistics. And in neurolinguistics addresses this issue of how language uh, affects the mind uh, or how we think. And this relates again to the research I was discussing earlier with Dr. Benaji, that words have power, basically. And how we think is defined by our conception of certain words. That's why I said, you know, trying to make the word idiot favorable doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you can just call somebody by the existing words in that language or in another language, which means something good, genius. Um, for me, Again, influenced by more science and influenced by what Prophet Noble Drali was conveying, I said, this just, that makes so much sense. Ask yourself why people who are Asian don't identify as yellow. Why are you so fixated on calling yourself by a color? And then if you tell me it's not a color, it's a political concept, political construct. Okay, so you gave me a political construct, but now I'm going to ask you, who are you? Where are you from? 
In other words, if, because I've heard people make the argument, it's a political construct. It means a reference to those of us who are pressed under the, the weight of global white supremacy. Okay, but now I was still gonna ask you the same question. Who are you? Where do your people come from? What contributions have you made to the forward flow of civilization? Because I, I, I get the importance of recognizing there's a system of oppression. I get that. But do you want to remain in the mindset always of being victimized so that you never move into the realm of, all right, but I have value and here's why I have value? Because people say, well, you know, I know we're descendants of kings and queens. And I'll say the same thing. Um, name some. Uh, um, Martin Luther King, uh, and since I'm trying to be funny, and I'm, I'm saying, see, you naming kings and queens, you know, Queen Latifah, I mean, that's fine that we know these individuals who have obviously made contributions in their own right, but you know what I'm saying. You're telling me you're proud to be quote unquote black. I want to know what you're proud of. You're telling me you're comfortable with being black. I want to know what you're comfortable with. Tell me at length what your value is based upon your blackness. And even and if you start going to a discussion of legacies in African history, I'm going to return you back to the same point. So what you're saying is you're proud to be African. So say it. Why do you keep fixating on the color or the political construct. This idea of seeing the importance of a name, right? Names, words have power. The ancient comedic principle of nomo, the power of the spoken word. These are things that I also was exposed to in Africa-centered circles, which is why it was so odd for me that I had people trying to affirm blackness or black to me, like I said, there's something else going on. So I say again, other folks are not calling themselves yellow Americans. There's no yellow power. There's no yellow consciousness. And those groups of people who are Asian of different nationalities, they have tended to do pretty well, even in the face of what we know as so-called global white supremacy, right? And yes, I know, that they know more about themselves, their culture's more intact, I agree. That's exactly why I'm telling you, figure out what your culture is so you can spread it and make it more uh, uh, influential within your community. Negroholism or Negroholic. Uh, basically, to me, when I thought of that, that's in reference to those of us who still think that we are Negroes or black. We're, we're obsessed with that. Even though if we really analyze it, we know it's destructive, just like alcoholism. An alcoholic essentially doesn't really know that she or he is destroying themselves by drinking an excess of alcohol. Or an alcoholic is one who knows that it's destroying them, but doesn't really care perhaps because they feel guilt or shame. It's a form of self-medication. Many counselors, psychologists will tell you. Um, and so the Negroholic, to me, was someone who's still obsessing over some guilt or shame about being a Negro or black. And they engage in self-destructive activities. Killing other brothers or sisters for a pair of sneakers or for an insult, a verbal insult. Bringing poison into the community because they're saying, I got to get mine and you got to get yours. And no sense of the danger or destruction that you're bringing about 
to that community. Um, going back to um, uh, one of the Africa-centered psychologists, Dr. Naim Makbar, when he talks about alien self disorder and anti-self disorder, and he emphasizes that that anti-self is the dis destruction of oneself or one's community in the ways I just expressed. So my reference to this, like I said, this Negroholism, or like I used to say when I was, was teaching at WVU, that we have many Negroholics and we need to go into a, a recovery system. And the recovery system is to learn to love ourselves, learn to love instead of hate, and to learn to love our true selves, and then learn about the system of oppression that functions around us. And the Negroholic is one who either doesn't see it yet and continues to engage in pathological or self-destructive behavior, or does see it, but still feels they're unworthy. There's the tragedy again. They're unworthy of doing anything to change it, you know, just because uh, it's too hard or they don't value themselves. Um, and there's the, again, going back to that reference to Othello and the tragic figure. All that, of course, is interconnected to, to that same argument. How do you encourage self-love? By teaching about ourselves, right? Teaching us who we are in fact, not in fiction. Teaching us, uh, I don't particularly care whether one's focus is on um, just Moorish history, or if one's focus is on Nile Valley civilization. Either one can result in having a renewed sense of value in what it is to look as we do, to look like people of predominant African ancestry. I will say that the value of recognizing the Moorish historical contribution or legacy is it's closer to the present, and it also, because of the things that I've talked about in terms of nationality and the law, that's more relevant too. And again, there's the brilliance of Noble Drew Ali. How did this man know this in nine, between 1913 and, and 1929? America had no Negroes, only oppressed and amnesiatic Moors. Essentially, this goes back to looking at the world from a Moorish perspective. Negroes were Moors who'd been, a, who'd been subjugated and turned into property or Negroes as a result of the asiento. And because they didn't have access to authorities to be able to free themselves, or because they didn't know, this goes back again to this issue of um, understanding the chaos of what's going on in the um, 18th and 19th centuries. African kingdoms are fighting each other. It had been going on, of course, since the time of the Portuguese arrival in the 15th century. This culminates then in different kingdoms selling their prisoners of war to other, uh, uh, either other kingdoms. And then when Europeans you know, came and required, they would sell them to Europeans along the coast. Part of the so-called triangular trade right, the asiento, the Spanish controlled system of the enslavement primarily of Africans. Um, the idea of flipping the history of so-called black America or Negro America around and saying, we're talking about Africans or Moors who were simply subjugated and oppressed and suffering from amnesia, right? So if you call yourself a Negro and you 
don't see any value in yourself and you believe in the inherent superiority of this new system that you're in. I'm talking about in the context from the 18th through the 20th centuries, I dare say even into the 21st century, then that means you don't see the value of who you are, which means you don't know who you are, which means you don't know your history, which means you have amnesia. The amnesia can be educationally imposed. It can be socially imposed. So that amnesia, that inability to remember anything, results in you only knowing what others have told you. So someone says, you know, you're the one who owes me money. When you, well, you know, you're suffering money, oh, I, what, you know, how much did I owe you? You owe me $2 million. Oh man, do I owe him to, yeah, you owe him to me. In other words, if the larger society is then complicit in saying you are a Negro, for the most part, complicit, you go along with that because you don't know any better. If you know better, then presumably you'll do better, and doing better means you will start to get out from under the term Negro. And I'll say again, and black as well, because black is simply the English word for Negro, and as I said earlier, more is not synonymous with black or Negro. I was doing the research uh, for my master's thesis, actually, in history, is when I first came across this print in a book by um, Rufus Wilson from the 1940s. And the book showed a portrayal of President Abraham Lincoln dressed in what would be considered traditional Moorish attire. And I remember looking at that and of course coming from a Moorish perspective and having a Moorish science background. I was curious as to who and this person was who produced that and what, what did this actually mean? Austrian cartoonist Volk does this image showing Lincoln, as he says, under the veil as if he was saying, I'm revealing who this person actually is. What made this different from the, the usual caricatures of Lincoln, some caricatures that could be seen in things like um, Harper's, which was a, a, a dominant uh, um, journal during the time, would show him almost looking buffoonish or like an ape and things that were very derogatory. But Volk's under the veil was not really anything that was offensive in terms of his phenotype. He just looked like a Moor wearing Moorish attire. So that got my attention because it made me ask the question, did Volk, as a European immigrant, also know that Moors were clearly an African people, but also did he know something about these links to Lincoln's own family? Adelbert Volk was an Austrian who had uh, come to the United States, immigrated to the US, and was known to be a supporter essentially of the Confederacy. And he did this cartoon, it was fairly popular during the day, and even earlier, to do caricatures or cartoons, you know, caricatured images of various people. So Volk did this one of President Lincoln um, sometime between 1861 and 1862, showing him with curly hair, looking a bit swarthier, wearing Moorish style pantaloons and having a Moorish scimitar and a medallion. And he entitled it Under the Veil. 
Now, what was interesting about it was that during that time, in the 1860s, Lincoln already had a reputation among many uh, Southern, quote unquote, whites, but many Southerners, that he was of mixed ancestry. Nancy Hanks was said to have been of mixed ancestry, uh, ancestry his, his mother. And when he was elected president, of course, we know that South Carolina shortly after seceded from the Union and uh, basically the Civil War began. Uh, a lot of the negative things said about Lincoln were simply attributed to his being opposed to slavery. But other Southerners surmised that maybe it was because he knew something about his own ancestry. That's another um, topic, potentially, in terms of you know, uh, coming back to that. But the bottom line is, Adelbert Volk produced this caricature showing Lincoln looking essentially like a Moor, basically having um, an awareness in the 19th century that the Moors historically were understood to be a predominantly African people, even though an African people clearly with Islamic roots or connections. Um, this is seen in the dictionaries, it's seen in the coats of arms, it's seen in the literature, even those who understood that when Shakespeare wrote his play, Othello, which I, of course, use that as the theme for my own uh, book, Othello's Children in the New World, Shakespeare clearly knew that Moors were references to African, a so-called black people. And I might even add, recently, um, there was a uh, historian, I forget their name, um, but they gave a presentation where they talked about Lincoln's work with something known as the William Dungy case in 1855. And that William Dungy case was where Dungy in the state of Illinois was found to uh, have gotten in trouble with people in the society who accused him of not being uh, quote unquote white. And they were arguing that he was a Negro. Lincoln defended him and argued that he was of Moorish ancestry. So that's another element of American history that's often overlooked. Now, why wouldn't people look more deeply at why Adelbert Volk did this? In fact, um, Volk had to flee the country um, in part because of his Confederate sympathies. But he came back in 1864, at least according to what Rufus Wilson says, and then um, produced a collection of his caricatures, but mysteriously didn't include this original one of Under the Veil showing Lincoln looking Moorish. So, you know, part of what this suggests to me is there clearly were Europeans, European Americans in the United States in the 19th century who were still fully aware of some Moorish aspect to the history of not just the United States, but the colonies which had preceded it. So that's that connection in terms of, of Volk's uh, Under the Veil and why I included it in the beginning of, of, of the book. I think what Volk was saying was that Lincoln was clearly not of pure European ancestry. And through the mind of this Austrian, Volk, and even in the history of the, the uh, Habsburg Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, there was clearly an awareness of the history of the Moors. Moors were clearly known to be if you will, predominantly African Muslims. Coats of arms confirm that. Volk coming from Austria, his sensibilities in looking at or hearing about somebody who had African ancestry would be to refer to them as der Moor, M-O-H-R, which is the, the German or Germanic version of the English Moor, which even has deeper roots that go back to the Latin mores, and the Greek Mavros, which according to first the work of J.E. Rogers and then um, Gerald Massey earlier in the, in the 20th century, 
and even uh, Webster's, I think it was the Webster's International Dictionary in, in 1980s, said that more is probably of African origin and was adopted by the Greeks, which to me would make, pardon the pun, more sense. So the term in Volk's mind was understood to refer to what people were calling so-called Negroes or colored people or so-called blacks of, of the time. gets into the spiritual component of our teachings too. Because all of what we're experiencing is about our ascension into higher knowledge. That's why it's a science, more science. The science or the knowledge of self. It's the starting point for being able to see, no pun intended, so much more, right? So um, that idea of the, the, you know, the tragic aspect that's how I connect it. Because tragedy is most of us know so little of our history. And sadly, so many of our own historians, people who call, you know, or study black history, don't know this either. And then when I share or bring it to them, they, they're, not all of them, but many of them are like, I'd never heard this. I, I never saw it. I, I, I missed that completely. And you know why? Because again, so much of what they think when they hear Moorish, or Moorish science, is something that has no legitimacy. It's not really the so C. Eric Lincoln, you know, one of the, the most revered um, scholars of African-American religious history discounted what, what was presented and said basically the prophet was making this stuff up um, that, you know, what do I mean with Moors? And now we're finding out by virtue of people like Ivan Van Sertima and fortunately I thought to take up that charge and to use what I was acquiring from mentors like Asante and mentors like Cato um, uh, and listening to what my uncle was sharing with me and said, I'm going to employ what I'm learning to find out. And I was prepared to discount it if it wasn't right. Let me be clear. I didn't go into this saying, you know, I got to prove Moorish science right. I went into it from the start going, I'm not sure. But then as I kept saying, I said, wait a minute, ancient Kemet, the prophet's talking about Kemet. We got several chapters in the Moorish Quran reference. What's, why is Kemet a, what's, the Gnostics? And what is the, the Gnostics are saying things similar. The Marabouts, the Murids, so I'm like, wait, wait a minute. Then I'm, Ivan Van Sertima, they came before, wait a minute. We were here in the Americas. All this is contained in Moorish science, right? So then I said, that's deep. And then to go into the diplomatic history and the, and the uh, legal history, and I'm going, this is real. What's so frustrating for me, as you can imagine, is, is that I wish more of us knew about it, even those who are affiliated with temples. The reason why I wrote the book is because I, and, the, and even the style of it, because, you, because I've even had my colleagues come and say, why do you have so many sections that have bold, you know, and then you italicize? I said, understand, I didn't really, I didn't write this book, this book for you or I, meaning the average academic. I wrote this book for those within the Moorish American community and the larger African American community. I even say the larger, quote unquote, Latino or, or Asiatic Spanish speaking community so that we could look at it and the, the bold things are meant to stand out. So you can really emphasize that and certain things that I highlighted because I know essentially how um, most people read if they're part of, people say, the rank and file. And yet I had to produce something that was chock full of primary 
and secondary sources from reputable um, scholars that was in one locale. Du Bois believed that an intellectual argument was the most powerful and important of all arguments. That's why, you know, he, you know, he, he felt that way until um, he got to be an elder and then said he didn't understand why people were rejecting him. But uh, I would say it's because as a whole, the nation um, was not emphasizing the same level of academic acumen that he knew was needed to see the value of an intellectual argument, and certainly not among our people. And a lot of our people didn't even have access to the same educational opportunities that those, say, in the European community did. And when we did have opportunities and we went to historically black colleges, Needless to say, historically black colleges and universities at the time were not going to talk about your Moorish or African foundations. They were going to refer to themselves as Negro, black, and colored because those were the terms of the day and the federal government um, which was funding those institutions wasn't particularly interested in helping people get off the plantation. The earliest dictionaries, the Dutch dictionaries and the English dictionaries, those are the two that I'm most familiar with. The term moor or morens or mores is used to refer to what we would say are so-called black people, what is more accurately African people, particularly African people of a darker olive comp complexion, but it can, be, it can, it can vary. In fact, when Leo Africanus, who was a Moor taken captive and then converted to Catholicism and then wrote a book about the history of, of the Moors, and he basically says the proper name for Af what people were calling uh, Ethiopes or Ethiopians or so-called Negroes was Moor. That's why the word more is so pervasive in so many languages. French, it's mur. Um, as I already said, Germanic languages, it's mur, M-O-H-R. And in part, people say it's because of the association with the Roman, the Latin mores. But then the Greek preceded it, the mavros, or moros. But as I said already, its origins are most certainly in Africa. So it was an indigenous term. The reason why the transition occurs is because as the Moors lose power, those European forces that are taking over see the need to start to denigrate, and I use that word intentionally, and devalue the African person, the African woman and man in history in order to justify the new conditions. The new conditions are now Europe is in ascension. Plus, I dare say, it also has to do with what then emerges with something known as the law of nations. Because theories around nationality and what that means and the law of nations and then treaties comes into play. So you have uh, um, people of European Christian ancestry saying, we have to emphasize now our greatness by devaluing the African. That's a part of it, and not all, but I would venture to say most who are in positions of power start to adopt that view. Then the second thing that they do is they understand that since we're talking about nations and the law, if we recognize you as a nation, under the sacred treaties, in fact, um, Emmerich de Vittel, who was recognized as having talked about the law of nations and the sacredness of treaties, said, 
nations should respect other nations. But if you create a situation where folks are under the law, made into non-persons, then what you're doing is creating a condition for their legal oppression. Now, it ain't right. Don't get me wrong. It ain't right. I'm not just because people will try to say, well, but, but so you're saying the legal. I'm not saying that, the, that doing that is justified because it's still immoral. You're still oppressing and abusing a people. But what I'm explaining is how the, the law worked within that context. And to some extent, it even worked in African or Asian or Native American communities as well that had a similar attitude. If you're part of our nation, then we recognize the need to protect and defend you because you're part of our nation. If you're not, then you should try to either get what we say uh, naturalized into it because other nations have naturalized in systems of naturalization, or you remain an outsider. So under the law, personhood was expunged to justify the asiento from a, uh, a group of nations that call themselves Christians and respecters of uh, the law of nations and the sacredness of, of, of treaties. So when you look at, like you said, something like the Bible, the earliest Bibles referencing Moor or Morans, and then eventually coming down the Ethiopians or just black, it's because the Bible is reflecting the new reality, or I would say new confusion, of the people of that era. It's why the average quote unquote black person on the, people say on the street, if you ask the average sister or brother why they're not black, or why, you don't, or why they shouldn't call themselves black, they would be lost, unless they were willing to sit down and listen for a while to the rationale for where this comes from. Like I said, understanding systems of oppression is key to being able to resist oppression. If you don't understand what the motivation was for putting that into place in the first place, you don't know how to deal with it. Orlando Patterson, who wrote, uh, who's a sociologist also at Harvard, who talked about um, slavery and social death. And he actually, I met the brother at a conference in Germany, and I had just recently read one of his quotes where he said he was, he actually got to a point where he refused to call quote unquote whites whites. He was calling them Euro American. And he was referring to us, if you will, as Afro American. And I asked him what happened. He said, I tried that for a while. I tried to get people to do it. He said, and man, the pushback was so great. He said, I just gave up. But the reason he did it was because he understood that the terms black and white were basically serving the agenda, if you will, of Eurocentric hegemony or so-called white supremacy. So he was essentially saying, you know, I recognize that was problematic and I tried to get people to, to stop using the term. I gave up. Right, because it's 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 reinforced so much that um, Dr. Akbar also coins a phrase um, uh, pathological normalcy, right? And I think that this applies. This pathological normalcy, we see pathological behavior as normal because it's done by the by the majority. It's normative, so it becomes the standard. But so much of what's needed is a mental paradigm shift so that folks can really understand what's going on. In this documentary, we took a deep dive to uncover the hidden negative effects of Black identity. We also demonstrated how you can begin your journey towards real freedom in America by embracing your Moorish descent. But this is just scratching the surface. Expanding on this topic are hours of more documentaries that completely disrupt the historical lies, societal norms, and narratives that have shaped the quote unquote Black identity. Now you can continue embarking on this groundbreaking journey of self-discovery that challenges conventional notions of identity and empowers the quote unquote black people to redefine who they truly are. The 14th and 15th Amendment does not address citizens of the United States of America. It addresses U.S. citizens. The prophet Nopadrali is 
specifically referring to us as citizens of the United States of America. And that, of course, is on our nationality identification card. She took a sampling of different mummies to find that these mummies had ingested coca, the coca leaf. They also found high rates of tobacco, not African tobacco, American tobacco. Nile Valley civilization was in trade with different indigenous peoples in the Americas. The Moore Science Temple of America in 1913 created the corporation, the, the corporation Moore Science Temple of America of 1928, and it created it for a purpose. The United States of America created the United States for a purpose, and, and the purpose was that now we're gonna get a, create a federal government out of this here. These and other series are all a part of our ongoing expansion of Amexum All Access, where we completely unpack a large range of pivotal topics. All Access members can access other deep dives into quote-unquote Black identity, the Moore Science Temple of America, Prophet Noble Drali, and Moore Science, as well as high-quality interviews, educational courses, and a wealth of other resources. All this content is available on All Access ad-free platform. By subscribing to the All Access Annual Plan, currently available for less than $3.66 per month, you gain full access to our ever-expanding library of content. Your subscription not only unlocks a treasure trove of knowledge, but also supports our team in creating more ambitious, evidence-based content. So don't wait to start your personal transformation journey. Watch these documentaries right now by clicking the button on your screen or following the link in the description. Your support enables us to continue shedding light on these crucial topics. Thank you for your support. Peace and love.